On air, online, on point. Slave times when there was a chance to be a state of the one year later. Hello and welcome to On Point. I'm Vanessa Soto. Women's rights have become a big issue in this year's presidential election. Both Democrats and Republicans are accusing the other party of waging a war on women. One issue that is important this year is women's right to birth control. Another issue is the double standard women face about their sexuality. Women who have sex outside of marriage can be labeled sluts whereas men seem to gain status for the same behavior. Also under discussion is women's work, inside the home and outside of the home. And the objectification of women in media. Are women judged more on the basis of their appearance than their abilities? But the most important issue may be which way women will vote in November. Let's go to On Point reporter Brendan Akamini for more on this issue. Thank you. Joining me today is CSUN Women's and California History Professor Nan Yamane and CSUN Women's Study Professor Heidi Schumacher. Thank you to both of you for coming on the show. Professor Yamane, I'd like to start with you. Um, it seems as though both parties have decided to make women's rights issues a major talking point in this year's election. But with all the other issues facing our country, such as the economy, health care, conflicts in the Middle East, why are women's rights being pushed to the forefront of discussion? Well, um, I think there have been a number of, there was the assault um, on the Planned Parenthood by the Komen Foundation, and when you're talking about issues of birth control, they, they hit fundamentally uh, women's lives, and I think that was uh, really important, and it was wonderful to see in, in one day uh, the Komen Foundation had changed their mind about pulling funding from uh, Planned Parenthood. Also, um, Obama's health care plan um, includes a number of issues that have been controversial. And these are, these are bread and butter issues. They're very important um, to uh, daily life and, um, and family economy. So I think that's one of the reasons that um, uh, they become important. What's wonderful is that we see the swift response, as in the case of the Coleman Foundation, and also in the case of uh, Rush Limbaugh um, calling that uh, a law student a uh, slut. So it's wonderful to see swift uh, response on the part of women. Uh, Professor Schumacher, uh, same question to you. Um, well, I think this kind of always happens right before a big election. Right now, you know, up until this week, there seemed to be about a 20-point gap um, between the two parties when it came to women and who they were intending to vote for. So everyone's after women's votes or trying uh, not to harm themselves from not getting women's votes. Um, and I also think that all of these issues that have come to the forefront, especially about family planning, um, directly relate to economic issues today, the ability to uh, plan and space your pregnancies for um, any couple and any family really affects their economy, their ability to be in the workforce, their ability to gain the education they want to gain. So um, as so much focus is on the economy, that goes hand in hand with a focus on especially family planning, but a number of women's issues. Now, uh, you mentioned with the economy and workforce with women, both sides in the election appear to be accusing the other sides of waging a so-called war against women. Um, with a strong stance by GOP candidates against birth control, like you were discussing, and Mitt Romney's recent claim that 92 percent of those who lost jobs under the Obama administration were female, do you believe that there is a so-called war on women that's being waged right now, uh, Professor Schumacher? Um, well, that's a tricky question. I'm not sure uh, it's as dire as some people have been pointing, as pointing it out to be. But I do think that a, a definite war on women's health and reproductive freedom has been waged um, recently. And then once again this week, questions of women working at home and working outside the home came to the forefront. So I'm not sure that there is a you know, war being planned in a room somewhere on women's lives. But I do think that women's choices and freedoms and agency um, does seem to be getting attacked from a variety, uh, on a variety of fronts. Uh, Professor mm -hmm. Yamane, why do you feel as though these issues are being attacked so much, these women's rights issues are being attacked so much in this election? 
Well, I, w I was thinking um, uh, of the long term. I mean, I mean, I think we've seen an assault on women's issues from uh, the end of the 1970s with the rise of the new right. And um, so, as, as you were saying, these things, these assaults have been going on for some time. Um, in fact, I think it's women's issues that help to uh, really organize the new right and bring together people um, in, in the political realm who had never worked together before. Um, uh, the uh, Catholics and fundamental Protestants came together over the right to life movement. So I think that is where uh, the real assault on uh, women's choices began at the end of the 1970s as a reaction to the women's movement. I think what happens now, um, I, I think with the Republicans, I, I mean, there was this, there are the occasional comments and then it will come up. Uh, I don't know that either party really puts a great deal of uh, political capital in women's issues. I think they're just reacting to a story that came out, you know, in the fore. And then there was the comment about um, uh, Mitt, Mitt Romney's wife, right? But I don't know that um, either party is, is all that dedicated to it. I think it's just there have been a number of issues recently that have put them on, uh, on notice about women's issues and the response. That's what I think is key here is the response to them. Oh. Uh, you mentioned the comments about Mitt Romney's wife and being a stay-at-home mother and never having worked. Why do, you believe, why do you feel there's been so much backlash against those comments that were made about her recently in the media? Well, I think, I mean, I think uh, the person who made those statements didn't, you know, she was really talking about class, uh, I think a larger class issue. But I think it is important to um, recognize uh, women's work at home and the family economy. I think it's very, very important. Um, uh, Selma James has recently spoken out about this. She's written about unwaged women workers. I think it's very, very important uh, worldwide. I mean, the UN often tracks uh, women's work in the home. Um, and, and all the work that women do um, that don't, and they don't get paid wages for it. I think this is one of the most radical issues that we can raise is, is what do we do about unpaid uh, housework, uh, whether it's women or men now, but you know, traditionally it's been women. I think it's a tremendous issue and I think uh, these women deserve a, a lot of respect. Um, I certainly try to do both, but that's because of the work of the first uh, the women feminists who came before me, uh, women and men, the feminists who came before me, uh, really it's because of them that I had choices, that I could do both. Um, but I think it's a very, very important issue. I think it's one of our most radical issues. It's unpaid, uh, unwaged uh, uh, work at home. So it, it seems as though most of the issues brought up in the election, though, so far appear to be have to do with birth control and things like that. But you say that you think more should be done about women at home as far as unpaid mothers and things like that? Well, I think, I think what to do about this uh, period of time where we have to raise children, what to do about it. You know, I think it's very, very critical, important work. But obviously the birth control issues are are in the news and important and they have to do also with Obama's health care plan and also women's access to um, birth control. I mean, uh, there are many places in the nation where uh, women don't have access to birth control choices, uh, really um, more than we'd like to, to think about. So uh, they're all important, all the issues, I think. Um, Professor Schumacher, you mentioned earlier about the the 20 point gap with voting in this upcoming election that was brought up. Um, a 2006 CNN poll found that a majority of women, especially non-whites, tend to vote more for Democrats than Republicans in election in elections. How do you think this trend can be explained? That's a great question. Um, there, there is a group of women that vote very reliably Republican, and those tend to be married white women. Um, but single women, young women, and women of color do tend to vote Democratic. Um, I think that that is partly because reproductive health is an incredibly important issue to those groups of women, um, as it is to most women and men um, on the planet, and certainly in our own country. So uh, that's, that's one issue that seems to drive a wedge for a lot of people.
Um, what about you, Professor Imani? What do you think some of the issues that force or influence women to vote more Democrat than Republican might be in elections? Well, I think, I think as, as you're saying, you know, um, class issues, I think class is incredibly important in this moment in time that we're in. I think a lot really does have to do with class, you know, as well as, as gender. And I mean, I think I agree with what you're saying. Um, and I, I think in the last election, since more young people and more Democrats, I think the problem with the Democrats the Democratic vote is always getting people out there to vote, right? Because there are many more. So. And uh, you had mentioned that you think one of the reasons is because of women's rights issues, such as birth control and things like that. Um, contraceptives such as condoms have been around since the 19th century, and the birth control pill has actually been FDA approved since 1960. So why is it over 50 years later this is still an issue that's being so hotly debated in this election? It's a great question. I mean, birth control goes back even further. We have, you know, from the ancient Greeks using uh, pomegranate seeds to there's actually pictures of condom usage in um, cave drawings from 15,000 years ago. I mean, this has been going on for so long, but it's only at certain moments that it seems to take something that should be so uncontroversial, like someone's ability to uh, space their own pregnancies and plan their own pregnancies, and it, it suddenly becomes controversial in so certain political moments. Um, and Although the pill became FDA approved in 1960, it actually wasn't legal um, for use until Griswold versus Connecticut in 1965. Mm -hmm. It became legal for married women's use. So it, it hasn't just been a um, sort of nice trajectory of, uh, I guess, medical invention and finding the right things and then just making them accessible. There's always been a lot of fighting, a lot of court cases, a lot of political action, both for and against con all kinds of contraception. And Professor Yamane, how important do you think the issue of a politician's stance on birth control is going to be to women voters in the election in November? Well, I think it's one of many issues, as you started out talking about, there's the war, there's a lot of other issues, but certainly it's critical because it is it is a bread and butter issue. It, it affects women, and I think the Obama health care uh, plan to include and, and cover birth control is, is very important, and uh, it also uh, cuts across um, uh, class lines as well, but I think it's it's very important. Um, this topic of birth control has actually led political commentator Rush Limbaugh to make insulting remarks about women's sexual activity. After a Georgetown Law student, Sandra Flew gave a speech to Congress advocating insurance coverage for contraceptives. Limbaugh called her a slut and a prostitute on air, bringing to attention a double standard our society has for the promiscuity of men versus women. Let's hear what some CSUN students had to say about this double standard. If women sleep around, they're not pretty much bad, and guys sleep around, they're not pretty much good. Depend on how do you sleep around with people, I think. Like, if you have one week and sleep every week with another person, that would be different than, like, looking for a serious relationship, I think. I think it's just, it's hard for girls because when guys go around sleeping around, they, congrat they almost congratulate each other and it's kind of glorified, and girls don't, they, maybe they'll judge them. And, or some girls might be attracted to that, I don't know. Whereas if a girl sleeps around with guys, they judge each other, and there's guys that's judging you. So it, it discourages girls from doing that, whereas guys, it's easier to do that. So I think it's just, it's sort of not fair. Honestly, I think, in my view, my personal opinion, it's, it's okay for a woman to have sex before marriage. I think it'll actually help the relationship. She'll get to know herself better, and know if she wants to accept her partner it's very unfair. Um, I feel like women, as soon as they have a couple of sexual partners, if they sleep around more than once, then they're looked at as whores or skanks or, you know, all the different inappropriate names. But as soon as a guy sleeps around, he gets high-fived and they're like, go ahead, you getting them all, you know. It's like a point thing. How many phone numbers or girls can you sleep with? And it's a celebration. But with us, it's we don't want to talk to her because she's been around or she slept with more than one person or things like that. Professor Schumacher, let's start with you. What are your thoughts on the students' response, not just their response, but also that issue as a whole? Well, there's a great book on double standards, and the title of the book is He's a Stud, She's a Slut. And that's, I think, what these students are talking about, that there's, uh, it's okay for more promiscuous behavior um, on the part of men in our society and young men than it is for young women. And that, 
you know, that's certainly changing. Women's sexuality is um, more fluid than it than it was at one time, but that double standard is still very much in play. And um, I would just add really quickly about the Rush Limbaugh comment that his reference to her being a slut, um, it just shows how powerful the word slut is, because his reference to her being a slut wasn't even related to her own um, having sex. Uh, she was talking about the use of contraception at a hearing where she was talking about a friend who had polycystic ovarian syndrome um, is, and her friend needing contraception in order to treat that, um, that condition. So because she was advocating for there being the availability of contraception, she was labeled a slut. It's not even that he called someone a slut who said, oh, I just had sex with 74 people. I mean, it wasn't, that wasn't the situation at all. And I, I was just going to say, I think also it, it shows how, um, how slow social change is. This is really very recent, social change. Um, growing up in the 50s, this, the S word, I mean, it had a terrific, terrific um, power to it. I mean, it's, and, and it has changed, but I think it changes very slowly. Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, you mentioned in your comments something about how women's sexuality is becoming more and more fluid. Can you kind of elaborate on that a little bit and explain what you mean? Sure, absolutely. I, I think that for a, a very long time, um, women's sexuality seemed to be uh, privileged when it was within a married, heterosexual, monogamous relationship. Um, after a certain age, uh, you know, hopefully with kids in mind, there are just certain kinds of sexuality that were seen as acceptable and good um, and American. And uh, being part of a nuclear family then um, really had to do with women's sexuality, being that kind of consuming unit. Um, and now uh, I do think women um, feel a bit more empowered to have sex before marriage if that's their choice. Um, they feel more empowered to claim as a choice the fact that they want to wait to have sex rather than it being something they have to do. Um, they experiment sexually with, um, you know, all genders. Some women feel empowered to make that choice. Um, and so that kind of fluidity to sexuality and not there being one kind of good sex and then all these other kinds of bad sex is what I mean when I say fluidity. And Professor Armani, can you kind of speak about how maybe the changing views of women in society may influence their the perception of them and their sexual activity? You mean historically? Right, historically uh, and the versus historical how they are how they view today. Well, I think you know, I think the change has been coming. It's been in process throughout the whole twentieth century. Of course, in the nineteen fifties there was a resurgence of an older idea, but even in the nineteen fifties you had the um, uh, you know the study of women's sexuality, and you had different you know. It, so I think it's been changing throughout the 20th century, but um, it just uh, it, but it's slow. I mean, it's slow. I think in terms of reaching uh, people's lives, and I think it makes a terrific difference if you live in San Francisco or Los Angeles versus um, the interior and, and places, you know, smaller communities. So we may feel like um, at CSUN, we may feel sort of empowered and there's a lot of, uh, you can belong to different communities, but um, I think still nationwide, there's, there are a lot of uh, communities where people are limited in their sexuality. What type of things do you think can be done, if anything, to change or get rid of this double standard that's in place on this issue? education, talking about it, um, talking about sexuality, you know, shows like this. I think I feel, um, uh, I was I was so pleased that um, CSUN is doing a show on, on talking about gender issues. I feel we haven't been talking about them enough. And um, I'm just hoping, as I say, with the reaction to uh, the Coleman Foundation wanting to pull money from Planned Parenthood and also um, uh, Rush Limbaugh's uh, comment and, and the Obamacare issues that I'm, I'm hoping that maybe um, there'll be a, a better discussion about women's issues because I think we haven't had one. Uh, Professor Schumacher, do you think more should be done? Women should be doing more to try to change this double standard that's in place? Women and men, yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I mean, women um, call each other sluts just as much mm -hmm. as 
men call women sluts. So um, there's both women and men need to work to um, really respect people's choices when it comes to their sexuality uh, and not assume that it's a good, cool thing when a guy does it and that it's uh, bad and problematic uh, when a woman does it. Um, there's also the issue with women in society today of women in the media. Um, just last week, hundreds of women responded to a call from the Daily Beast to describe moments in their lives well, where they felt judged for their appearance or so-called Ashley Judd moments. Do you think women are judged too fairly by the media? And do you think men are judged just as harshly? Uh, Professor Schumacher? Are, I'm sorry, so the question is, do I think um, women and men are judged too harshly by, by the, the media? Specifically women, but do you think it applies to men as well? Absolutely, yes. I, does, I, I do think that they're judged too harshly and also that it applies to men as well. Um, the incidence of um, body dissatisfaction and of eating disorders in men is on the rise. Mm -hmm. um, the way when we look at um, studies that are done of magazines, the ways that women's bodies have been displayed in magazines for some time where they're broken up into parts, um, especially parts without clothes on, in order to display something. We're now seeing that happening to men in magazines as well. Um, so all of these things that we used to study and say was so problematic about the way women's bodies were being treated by the media are now really starting to happen more and more to men. Mm -hmm. Especially in Los Angeles, I was going to say a place like Los Angeles where there's, you know, hyper vigilance about how you look, about um, uh, appearances, um, and a plastic surgery for men as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I agree. I think especially here, um, young men are feeling more the pressure about looks. Yeah. Um, with regards to women, though, and how they're portrayed in the media, do you think that putting such an importance on appearance and things like that are hurting the hurting the efforts of women to try to achieve more equality in society and put them on level footing with male? Do you think um, the media is harmful to that, Professor Schumacher? Sure, yeah. As long as we continue to value the, you know, the looks as the thing we value most about women, we're not valuing their intelligence or their compassion or um, their education or their ability to contribute to the economy. So um, as we spend all of our focus talking about what someone wore or ripping them apart or saying that she gained weight or that her face looks puffy, like in the Ashley Judd um, example, um, we're not thinking about Ashley, you know, how Ashley Judd went to graduate school, how Ashley Judd works for world health issues and, and women's issues. And um, so I think for women to be on real equal footing with men, we're going to have to start um, valuing them as really whole beings and not just the way they look. And that means the media needs to do that, but also we as individuals need to do that about each other and about ourselves. And even back in the election with John McCain, when Sarah Palin was running, I remember when she was running, there was a huge pressure put, amount of pressure put on her, Sarah Palin's appearance or what she was wearing and what she looked like. Mm -hmm. What do you think that says about our society when even during a presidential election, that much focus is put on appearance versus political stance to a certain degree? Professor Yamane? Well, I, I fear, and I think you're right, I think it's very important what women think because women internalize these ideas and these views so it's not just men. Um, but I, I fear it's the tip of a larger iceberg that encourages um, uh, the media, encourages a shallow, uh, not enough attention to the depth of issues. Um, there's any number of examples of this, you know, are, are um, I think we have this, this MSN and this Fox, sort of this false dichotomy of, of what's going on in the world. And, and lots of people, that's how they are informed. And, and it's really a false um, uh, dichotomy. I just think that the way women are portrayed as part of a larger pattern of being shallow and not really pursuing the depth of, of issues. Um, and in closing, I'd like to ask both of you the same question. I'll start with you, Professor Schumacher. What advice would you give candidates in this election who are trying to win the vote of women? Wow, that's a big question. Um, uh, I think 
the advice I would give is to stop treating women like they're one clump group and that we all think the same and have the same issues as our primary issues. Because I know I get frustrated whenever I hear about the women's vote as though it's one big block. Because there are women for whom birth control and access to birth control is going to be their very most important issue. And there are women for whom jobs and creating more jobs is going to be their very most important issue. So to stop treating women as such a block and instead start looking at the differences amongst women, not just um, that all women are going to want if I say my correct talking points about birth control and abortion, then I'm going to get the women. And what would you say to them, Professor Yamane? I guess um, I guess I would say um, uh, something um, similar. I I guess I I think of um, there are so many differences among among women, um, and I think I, I guess I want to say. Um, just to be genuine, I just feel that there are so many um, shallow issues. Well, we haven't really had, well, I guess we're going to have the real, uh, you know, when we have the Republicans and the Democrats fighting against each other, maybe we'll have something more. Re I guess I haven't taken it that seriously so far, is what I'm trying to say, but um, just to, to take women seriously. Well, that's all the time that we have today. I want to thank both of you so much for coming on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Packers. Viking. Packers. Viking. Packers. Viking. Red state. Blue state. Vegan. Carnivore. We come from different places. Uptown. Downtown. Optimus. Center. We come to different conclusions. Half empty. Half full. But when we live united, we create real, lasting change in the building blocks of life. The education, income, and health of our communities, <laughs> our families, united. even the person next to us. Live united. Real change won't happen without you. <laughs> So give, advocate, volunteer, live united. Sign up at liveunited.org. I really didn't want to tell anybody, and I didn't. Hiding sadness makes you more and more sad. If you're strong enough to just open your mouth, that's all it takes. The healing is in me and can also be extended to others. Giving voice to what you're feeling is part of the healing. kitchen surfaces, utensils, and hands with soapy water. One in six Americans will get sick from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Lead paint poisoning affects over one million children today. If your home was built before 1978, call or log on. We would like to thank you for watching On Point. You can follow us on Facebook by searching CSUN On Point. And on Twitter at CSUN On Point, all one word. This show appears on our website at CSUNTVNews.com. And we air on Los Angeles' own Channel 36 Sundays at 4 o'clock. Tune in next week when we will discuss the study abroad programs, their safety, politics, and their academic value. Thank you for watching On Point. I'm Vanessa Soto. And I'm Brendan Nakamini. Have a great day. Play times when you're in the, 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 the state of the attorney wanted to get rid of